Hi, I'm Larry Reed, and you're listening to the Libertarian Christian Podcast. Welcome to the show that gets Christians thinking about faith and politics. Get ready to challenge the status quo, expand your imagination, and tackle controversy head on. Let's stand together at the intersection of faith and freedom. It's time for the Libertarian Christian Podcast. Welcome to another episode of the Libertarian Christian Podcast, a project of the Libertarian Christian Institute. I'm your host, Doug Stewart, and today we are going to talk about loving our enemies in an age of violence. We have a special guest with us today, Ron Sider, who is the founder and president emeritus of Evangelicals for Social Action and distinguished professor of theology, holistic ministry, and public policy at Palmer Theological Seminary at Eastern University. He is author of more than 30 books, including Rich Christians in an Age of Hunger, Nonviolent Action, and the topic of today's conversation, If Jesus is Lord, subtitle, Loving Our Enemies in an Age of Violence. Ron, thanks for joining us. Glad to do it, Doug. So there are a lot of books out there on pacifism and what it means to follow the message of Jesus consistently. And I know a lot of people you know, they have a lot of objections to, well, what about this verse? Well, what about this situation? And and of course, we're going to get to that in our conversation today. But one of the things that I really love about your book is that it isn't just kind of topical with like verse by verse, you know, here's what this says, here's what that says, you know, look, we got to follow Jesus. You actually go back into Christian history. How were these passages interpreted? You actually, i honestly thought you gave uh, a little bit more deference to the people who object and say, you know what, we need to take their criticisms seriously and make sure that we're reading this passage correctly. And in not every instance in your book, you come to like, nope, this is a hard and fast thing. And so your approach to informing and educating us on what is the ethic of Jesus and what does the Bible say and sort of getting down to that question, did Jesus really say we could never use violence? I thought was a really, really thorough account. And I recommend, this is probably going to be the new book I tell people, like, if you really want to know what it looks like to be a nonviolent person following Jesus, I'm going to start with this book. So thank you for your contribution on this. I think the where I'd want to start here in our conversation is a lot of people think that pacifism means standing by and watching injustice happen. And you certainly take that seriously in your book. But what is this third way that you talk about in the book? Yeah, well, I think that that's perhaps the most uh, serious objection to the kind of position I take, because many people think that... Um, Pacifists don't take their responsibility to love their neighbor and protect their neighbor seriously. Mm -hmm. C.S. Lewis has a famous uh, comment uh, about it, saying that he doesn't think Jesus would uh, let somebody push him aside in order that that he could get to killing his neighbor. And I think Lewis is right. Uh, Gandhi famously said, if there are only two options— to do nothing or to kill, then of course we kill. But in fact, there's always a third option. We can always intervene nonviolently, vigorously, but nonviolently to protect neighbors. And I did a previous book before I got to this one, precisely for this reason. It's called um, Nonviolent Action, What Christian Ethics Demands, but Christians have hardly ever really tried. And it simply tells the story of Case after case after case, Gandhi, Dr. King, solidarity in Poland, overthrowing dictator Marcos in the Philippines, on and on of very successful nonviolent campaigns. And in fact, uh, Columbia University Press just a few years ago published a very careful scholarly study where um, two scholars examined about 300 of the major nonviolent and violent campaigns against injustice uh, and for justice in the last 100 plus years. And they discovered that, in fact, the nonviolent campaigns are about twice as likely to succeed as the violent campaigns. So there's always a third possibility. And recent history, the last 50, 75 years, have demonstrated that again and again and again, it works uh, with some frequency better than, than violence. So we don't have to choose between practicality or pragmatics and being faithful to Christ because the long run faithful to Christ is also uh, the better option. 
I think if Jesus is truly who he said he was and who the church has believed him to be, then in the long run, doing what he said and success will in fact come together, but not in the short run. You know, the cross reminds us that uh, loving our enemies doesn't always work in the short run. Sometimes you get killed. But then, of course, uh, war doesn't always work either. So, you know, I can imagine some objections from our listeners thinking, you know, something you just said a moment ago is that there's always a third way where we can, you know, vigorously react or step in, intervene nonviolently. And there's a sense in which I think the objection comes down to, you know, in our minds, we visualize uh, an active shooter at an elementary school or an open restaurant or mall or something like that. And we think, well, what's our option there? And, you know, clearly this is like the biggest, uh, you know, specific objection. I'm sure you've you've never heard this before. I'm being sarcastic, of course. Uh, so what is what is the you know, if there's always something that's an option, is there a path for us to say, all right, well, I'm going to learn what that is so that if I'm in that situation, if I'm a teacher or a superintendent or whatever, I can make this violence stop happening? Yeah, I think that there are all kinds of things that we can do to increase our use of nonviolence in police work. Uh, if we really wanted to make that a major part of what we did as a society, there would be lots and lots of ways that uh, we could strengthen um, training and techniques and so on to um, do that rather than immediately move toward a, a violent solution. But I don't pretend that there uh, are not occasional, really hard cases. I doubt that the very, very occasional situation where you've got a shooter up in a tower uh, every two seconds, you know, killing the students uh, down below, uh, I doubt that that settles the question of whether or not Christians should go to war. Yeah. I mean, I think for me, the, the biggest lament that I have about Christians and gun rights in particular is that it's the only option we've considered and it kind of gets shoved under the rug as like, well, it's our last resort. I know, I know I shouldn't have to shoot somebody, but if I have to, I will, because you know, it's the last resort. Do you see any problems with that approach? I mean, what are your, I mean, clearly you're writing a book about nonviolence. So I want to know your opinion on, and on that whole attitude of, well, it's a last resort, even though I don't really want to. You know, I think that if you're a Christian, if you think that uh, Jesus is true God and true man, and that he came both to die for our sins and also to show us how to live, then the first question has to be, what did Jesus tell us? So that's where I want to start. Uh, and, and then, you know, after we get clear on what Jesus taught us, uh, then we can continue to wrestle with hard cases. You Early on in the book, you make sure that people understand what you mean by the words coercion and violence. And those are, of course, two words libertarians often talk about, and we we like to define them. And, and I think for us to continue our discussion here, it'd be good for, for us to know what's the difference in, in your mind between those two. Yeah, well, I think coercion is not necessarily wrong. There is social coercion just... Um, by growing up in a family, you know, there's significant psychological coercion. When the church exercises the very best loving church discipline, that's coercion of a significant kind. When you engage in a, an economic boycott, uh, loving the people who are doing wrong, but uh, imposing major economic penalty, uh, that's, that's coercion. Uh, violence is using coercion in wrong ways. I think that even a certain kind of psychological manipulation is evil violence, although it's not lethal. And uh, certainly, I think, obviously, killing somebody um, is violence. So that coercion is legitimate if it's done in a way that respects the other person, loves the other person, always gives the person uh, a chance to change. Uh, a powerful economic boycott always gives the other person uh, or persons a chance to change. And you can express your love and then even invite them to accept Christ uh, and be engaged in an economic boycott. I don't see how you can express your love if you pull out a gun and kill them. Yeah, I mean, I think what you're doing is you're taking into account love for neighbor, including the person who is violently acting toward neighbor one. Right. I mean, another example of appropriate coercion would be if um, 
if a friend were contemplating uh, suicide up in a bridge, uh, it would be fine to um, to grab them <laughs> and physically uh, restrain them. But that's not inappropriate violence. That That is appropriate coercion. Yeah, I think physical restraint is another form of, you know, stopping violence, of course. I mean, there's many ways that can be done. One thing that I have often thought might maybe not solve the problem, but, you know, technology has given us the ability to imagine ways of accomplishing things that, you know, generations ago or even, you know, 10, 20 years ago, we we would never thought possible. And, you know, what comes to my mind in this situation, this conversation is, you know, I've watched like PG rated movies with my kids. And whenever there's uh, somebody getting shot, depending on, you know, like if it's a kid's spy movie or whatever, they're never getting shot. What they're getting, what's happening is they're getting shot with like a dart that passes them out or whatever. And like, <laughs> what, what, I yeah. just kind of want to get your thoughts. Like if, if we had a world where, the guns that we use to stop violence were in that form. Would you would you be okay if we were arming ourselves to do that kind of uh, prevention? Well, we currently have um, stun guns that um, police um, are with some frequency uh, armed with. It doesn't uh, kill a person. Uh, it, um, it you know knocks them out, disables them for a short time so they can be arrested. I have no problem whatsoever with um, that sort of thing or with the kind of... Um, dart that you talk about, um, we ought to explore all kinds of non-lethal alternatives of that sort. So one of the things I mentioned earlier in in kind of introducing your book is the theological themes that you discuss. And I think this conversation often devolves into uh, this conversation over should you be a pacifist or whether or not it's biblical and so forth kind of devolves into the relevant texts. And that's important, of course, to, to discuss. And you certainly do that in your book. And I'll just remind listeners, if you didn't hear Ron, you know, give his take on a verse that is the one that's sticking in your mind as the the one thing that keeps you from being a pacifist or something like that, then, you know, read the book because I'm pretty sure he covers all of them. But I think it would be really good to talk about the context of the first century messianic hope that Jesus came into. And what's the theological, like kind of the broader theological grounds for believing in an age of nonviolence? Yeah. Well, if one's going to understand what Jesus said about loving our enemies, it's essential that you understand the historical setting. And the first part of that is that um, most Jews around the time of Jesus were expecting a military Messiah who would lead in a huge battle and defeat the Romans. And furthermore, uh, we know from Josephus, this first, um, the, the Jewish historian of this period, that there were lots of violent Jewish revolutionaries, um, often devout uh, with some frequency with messianic claims, and they called on the people to rebel against Rome. And there were a whole number of uh, examples where Jews did that. The Romans regularly crucified them. They crucified 2,000 people in the city of Sepphoris, um, not too long uh, uh, close to the time of Jesus' birth because of uh, rebellion. Uh, and Sepphoris is just a few miles from Nazareth. So there was in the air this expectation of a violent Messiah, and a lot of Jews were calling the Jews to rebel and, uh, against the Romans. In fact, they they said that if they did that, that would hasten the coming of the Messiah. Jesus comes, he says, I am the Messiah, but he has a whole different picture of what it his messianic approach is. It means loving enemies. The violent revolutionaries you know, said, kill the Romans. Jesus said, uh, they have the legal right to carry your pack one mile, but carry it a second mile. You know, and he's talking about the national enemies of the Jewish people. He says that um, he's going to die for the sins of people, and he goes to the cross loving his enemies. Uh, it's really important to understand that At important points, Jesus explicitly sets aside what the Old Testament had said. When um, he says, uh, don't take an oath. It's been said, you know, don't uh, break your oath, but I say don't take an oath at all. Uh, There are a number of clear commands in the Old Testament where the people of Israel are told to take an oath. Uh, And then he says, uh, you've heard that it was said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I say to you, don't resist evil. And there, 
Jesus, eye for an eye, is the very center of Near Eastern jurisprudence from the time of the Code of Hammurabi uh, in uh, the 18th century BC. And it's absolutely central to what the Old Testament says. Again and again and again, the Old Testament says people of Israel are commanded to take an eye for an eye. Now, this was actually a positive provision because our human instinct is not just to do an eye for an eye, but to do two eyes for one eye. Mm-hmm. So saying an eye for an eye, you know, is is moderating evil instinct, but it still is a central Old Testament command, the very center of Old Testament jurisprudence. Uh, and Jesus says, no, uh, my people don't do that. He says, the, the word uh, is sometimes translated, do not resist evil. And, and that's a very bad translation. If you look at how that word, that Greek word is used, it actually is used usually in the Old Testament and in Josephus to mean violent resistance in a military kind of context. So she, Jesus is not saying be passive, do nothing, but he's saying don't resist evil in a violent uh, military kind of way. Now, if that's what Jesus said, then if, like Reinhold Niebuhr, you don't really believe he's true God, uh, then you can say, uh, yeah, that's nice, Jesus, but it doesn't work in our world. Sorry, but we won't live that way. But if you believe what the church has said for 2,000 years, namely that Jesus is true God as well as true man, uh, then it seems to me it's a big problem to tell Jesus, sorry, what you tell us doesn't work in the real world. So that, it seems to me, for any orthodox, small o, orthodox Christian, we have to start with what Jesus said. How do you reply to people who say, okay, well, yeah, me personally, yeah, I should resist evil by, you know, doesn't mean give up, um, and I should be a pacifist personally, but then when it comes to things like, you know, foreign policy, I, you know, we, you got to have people being protected from invaders, so Jesus' Sermon on the Mount doesn't apply because that's about me personally. Yeah, I think one of the most important responses to the kind of position I'm arguing is to say that Jesus is talking about personal, private situations. He's not talking about public life. So in our personal life, yes, we love our enemies. Uh, In our public life as citizens, as soldiers or police officers or whatever, you know, we appropriately kill The problem with that is that there's just no hint in the text whatsoever that uh, Jesus is making that kind of distinction. In fact, the text is full of kinds of references uh, about public sorts of things. When he says, don't do an eye for an eye, that's not some personal private thing. That's the very central principle of jurisprudence in the ancient world and in among the people of Israel. That's a very public thing. When Jesus says, um, if you're uh, asked to carry a pack one mile, carry it two miles, the violent revolutionaries uh, almost certainly said, don't carry it at all and kill the soldier if you can. But Jesus says, carry it a second mile. Now, the Roman soldiers had the legal right to insist that a colonial person uh, in their empire would carry the pack one mile. But they were forbidden to make the person carry it two miles. So Jesus is talking about an issue of public life. He's talking about the national enemy of the Jewish people, his people. Uh, He's not talking about some personal private thing. So there's just no basis in the text um, for that. Some people try to argue that uh, uh, Romans 13, you know, uh, helps with that. In uh, Romans 12, Paul seems to be almost quoting Jesus, not quite, but it's clear echoing of Jesus, where he says, um, don't do vengeance, leave that to God, um, respond in loving ways to evil persons. And then in chapter 13, Paul says government's ordained of God, and government, in fact, um, punishes evildoers. And it doesn't use the sword in vain, as, as part of the text. The problem is that Exactly the same key Greek words are used in chapter 12 and chapter 13. In chapter 12, uh, the key words um, are used to say Christians must not do that. And then in 13, it says that's what government does. 
But there's nothing in chapter 13 that says Christians are supposed to do that. Christians are supposed to respect the government and pay their taxes, but uh, nothing says that they're supposed to participate in the government's use of the sword. And when you have exactly the same words in chapter 12 saying that Christians should not do that, and then in 13 saying government does that, surely the proper conclusion is that Paul means to say that Christians act in a certain way. Government sometimes does some other things. And God can use that, but uh, Christians are not supposed to do that. You know, a lot of the pacifist rhetoric and ethical kind of sourcing has often come from the Sermon on the Mount and other teachings of Jesus. And one of the chapters or several chapters that you deal with is you also talk about how Paul, how the letters of Paul echo the teachings of Jesus. You kind of touched on it there a little bit, but there's them there with Romans 12 and 13. Where else does Paul echo the teachings of Jesus? Well, the, the Romans 12 is the most clear, explicit case. In other places, um, he sometimes says, um, not I, but Jesus says this, not not specifically on our topic, but uh, he sometimes says that sort of thing. I point out that all through the New Testament, there's an emphasis on peace in a whole variety of ways. Um, when Paul talks about uh, the peace between Jews and Gentiles, He's talking about the worst hostility in the ancient world. They hated each other. Josephus tells us again and again how they slaughtered each other at this time. And and Paul says that Jews and Gentiles both get accepted with God on exactly the same basis, namely the cross of Christ. And the result is a new social peace between Jew and Gentile. So that's just one example of the basic theme of loving enemies carrying over in the rest of the uh, New Testament. So before I get into a couple of the like, but what about this verse? I do have one question that honestly, I hadn't really thought about it with respect to, and this is a theological theme, is the resurrection and what the resurrection has to say about life in Christ and being nonviolent. So could you give us a, like, how does the resurrection bolster support for nonviolent ethic. Yeah, I um, I have a whole chapter on underlining key theological issues, and one is who Jesus is. If he's true God, then you know, we have to listen to him. But another is the resurrection. I mean, it's really striking when you realize Jesus claims to be the Messiah, and then he gets crucified by the Romans. And the general expectation was that when the Messiah came, he would defeat the Romans. Uh, and N.T. Wright, the great New Testament scholar, points out that there's absolutely no evidence anywhere where a person at this time, a Jewish person, claimed to be the Messiah and then got defeated by the Romans rather than c- conquering the Romans. Not a single instance where the disciples of that person continued to believe in him after he got killed by the Romans. The only Jewish conclusion on Saturday after uh, Good Friday was that Jesus was a fraud, a fake. He'd failed. And the only reason the disciples could then continue to say, yes, he is the Messiah, in spite of getting killed by the Romans, was because they met the risen Jesus. So the resurrection is absolutely crucial to the early churches, um, you know, the first Christians, understanding that Jesus, in fact, was who he said he was. But it's also, I think, central for us today, because sometimes in the short run, loving enemies doesn't work, doesn't always change vicious enemies into bosom friends instantly. And it's finally the promise of Jesus and Christian faith that eventually Christ will return we will be resurrected and uh, justice will prevail and all things will be made new. It's, it's that promise that gives Christians the, uh, the courage and the strength to respond nonviolently, even when in the short run it doesn't seem to be working. Because we know where history is going. We know how it's going to end. And the resurrection is the solid evidence for that. 
Hi, this is Carrie Baldwin of MereLiberty.com and a contributor here at the Libertarian Christian Institute. If you haven't heard, I'm debating Walter Block on the question of whether a woman has the right to evict or abort her fetus at any time during her pregnancy. This debate will be hosted by the Soho Forum at 3 p.m. on Sunday, December 8th at the Subculture Theater in New York City. Tickets for this event range from $12 to $24. Seating is limited and will likely sell out. Register now to reserve your seat. You can buy tickets at thesohoforum.org. To hear more about my position, you can visit my website at mereliberty.com slash abortion. So, okay, I'm I'm sure, you know, in the past 25 or so minutes, uh, we've got people thinking, yeah, but what about this verse and so forth? So I'm sure we have to, we have to oblige those, of course, because those are an important part of understanding things. And one of the things that I think is, I would say contributes to the problem. I wouldn't say generally is problematic is this principle that, and this isn't necessarily incorrect, that the the clearer statements in scripture ought to outweigh the ones that are not as clear. And so when you read Jesus saying, I came not to bring peace, but a sword, you think, oh, well, that's really clear. I don't have to be a pacifist anymore. Or when Jesus tells Peter and his disciples uh, to go buy a sword. Or when you read things in the book of Revelation, which admittedly aren't as quote unquote clear as something like, I came not to bring peace, but a sword. So let's start with, I came not to bring peace, but a sword. I mean, that's like the clearest non-pacifist verse in the Bible, Ron. Yeah, almost all scholars, um, evangelical scholars uh, and others, uh, not not all, but the vast majority think that Jesus is talking about the kind of conflict in families and in communities when some people accept Christ and others uh, do not. Uh, Luke has sort of the same uh, story and setting, and it's clear in Luke. uh, I think his wording is that I came to bring division. Jesus doesn't mean that he wanted division, but he's saying, you know, um, not everybody's going to accept me. And uh, that brings painful conflict in families, in communities, uh, but very few serious um, New Testament scholars think that Jesus meant that literally he was calling on his people to use a sword. Yeah, I mean, the rest of his actions certainly don't support the action of, well, I came not to bring peace, but I want you to be more violent or, you know, he didn't just stop by saying, I came not to bring peace. Don't, you know, so, but a sword obviously has a, has a metaphorical meaning to it as well. Now, all around uh, that particular word uh, or short statement uh, is Jesus talking about the way that his coming uh, brings conflict with, between mother and daughter and father and son, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So what about when he tells his disciples, this is near when he is about to be arrested uh, to buy a sword? Like we can arm ourselves if we have to kind of, uh, that's kind of the application. I think a lot of American Christians uh, want that to be. Yeah. And the disciples say that uh, here we have two and Jesus says, that's enough. <laughs> you know, the kind of standard uh, just war interpretation of the passage is that, okay, Jesus is now preparing his disciples for his departure and they'll have to be on missionary journeys. And so he's preparing them to use a sword to protect themselves. Just think about it. Does anybody suppose that two swords, Jesus says that's enough when they say they have two. Does anybody think two swords would be enough even for 12 disciples, Uh, much less uh, the early church? Uh, And uh, um, just a little bit later in the story, uh, one of Jesus' disciples, uh, apparently it was Peter, uh, tried to protect him when the... uh, Jewish authorities came to arrest him, uh, and he used his sword, and Jesus condemned him uh, vigorously uh, with the general statement that those who use the sword will perish by the sword. And a little bit later, he tells uh, Pilate um, that um, his disciples um, do not fight. Uh, so uh, even even Calvin says that you know the disciples got it wrong and were confused. Um, Very few uh, serious New Testament scholars think that Jesus means to say, 
that his disciples are now supposed to arm themselves with the sword. If that's what he wanted, why he would have told them to have more than two, and he would have um, approved of Peter's uh, trying to protect him, and he certainly wouldn't have told Pilate that my disciples uh, you know, don't kill him. How does the book of Revelation sort of run in your in your way of looking at it? Because, you know, clearly you look at it and you see, I mean, there's lots of blood all over. And it's one of the most difficult books to interpret. And so what is what is your take on the book of Revelation? And and honestly, I'll say that I have had people say, well, if, if you know, you know, Jesus in the Gospels is, you know, pretty, pretty peaceful, but that's not what it's going to be like when he comes back. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I take that seriously. I have a whole section in, in the book on that. Uh, and I think the first thing to say is that, um, you know, toward the beginning, um, uh, one of the early chapters, uh, uh, there's the scroll that nobody can unroll. And uh, it says that the lion of the tribe of Judah, that's a kind of military image, <laughs> um, uh, is the one who can do it. And he comes, and who is it? It's the lamb who was slain. And a couple dozen times, again and again and again, Jesus is described as the lamb who was slain. That's the central image of who Jesus is. But uh, it's also true that uh, Revelation says that God punishes evil. And it's important to realize that with some frequency, the New Testament says that God does some things that persons, Christians, are not supposed to do. Uh, There is no place in Revelation where it says that Jesus' followers are to join in a battle and slay wicked people. What it says in, in very figurative language, I think, is that in the end, justice will prevail, evil uh, will be punished, and uh, the God who is the perfect combination of love and justice, perfect combination of um, knowledge um, and uh, infinite wisdom, that God knows enough to know how to punish evil. And I think it would be finally... um, a very evil world if it were true that evil continues forever, unrestrained and unpunished. And the Bible tells us that that's not true, that in the end, um, uh, the risen Lord prevails and um, that is good and just, but it never says God's people, uh, our Christian people are supposed to be involved in, in that um, punishment. So I can imagine somebody wondering and that, you know, what you just said there, like Christians aren't supposed to be part of this judgment. And outside of the the situation where God would sort of, and again, I'm going to speak hypothetically here, orchestrate where people die or are punished in a certain way outside of human action. I mean, are you, are you, You know, when we think about the state, we think about, you know, there is injustice being punished or or for that matter, I mean, forget the even just punishment, but like, let's say there's good restoration going on in in punitive in uh, the penal code. I wonder if Christians don't want only non-Christians in roles where the state or other governmental entities are the ones sort of carrying out the justice on a practical level? Like, should we only have non-Christian soldiers if there's going to be soldiers? Should we only have non-Christian people involved in government, you know, just because in parts of government that carry out violence in certain ways? Or I guess I want to get your take on some of those thoughts. Yeah, well, I mean, there's a certain um, tradition in my own um, Anabaptist history, um, an early uh, 16th century confession, the Slytime Confession, seems to suggest that uh, Christians shouldn't kill, but God wants government to do that. Um, I think that's a problem. Um, I think if Jesus is saying that we should love and not kill our enemies, that 
is his word for everybody. I think there would be ways for government to restrain evil in nonviolent ways if we really uh, wanted to uh, put massive effort into um, exploring and training for that. I'm not opposed to locking up people even for life if they're continuing to threaten society, but I'm not in favor of capital punishment. So I want to say that if Jesus says we shouldn't kill, that's what he means for everybody, not just for a certain group of Christians or for or for all Christians. Right, or for private individuals only. Right, yeah. right. So, you know, they, they often say that if you're introducing new ideas or maybe even like <laughs> um, like people go on a diet and they say, you know, well, if you take away the sugar, you got to replace it with something or whatever. And I can imagine people thinking, all right, well, you've made a really good case. And, and I, I, of course, I don't expect anybody to be fully convinced in a 40 minute episode of a podcast. But along their Christian journey, they might be saying, all right, I, I can entertain this. However, you're going to have to give me something here. If you're going to disarm me of the things that I can use, that I know I can use to stop, you know, immediate threats of violence, then what are you going to arm me with? Now, you mentioned this at, at the very beginning that there's there's a whole, you have actually a whole book on this called Nonviolent Action on, you know, here's how people have done this. But give us a taste of the kinds of actions Christians would engage in if we all decided, if we all somehow came to the conclusion and we agreed Yes, Jesus calls us to live nonviolently. Now what are we going to do to fight against violence? And, and in particular, I have two things in mind that you talked about in your book is citizen patrols and the civilian-based defense. Yeah. Um, you know, we don't know what would happen if all Christians decided that they re would refuse to kill. I think that two things would happen. I think that um, with um, sometimes significant numbers of Christians would get killed. I also think that God would surprise us uh, and that uh, there would be miraculous kinds of things happening. You know, the third century uh, Christian writer, Origen, he was probably the most uh, widely read Christian in the middle of the third century. He responded to a book by a, a pagan called Celsus who ha had attacked Christianity. And one of his major arguments was that um, if um, you know all the Roman uh, folk in the Roman Empire became Christians, then uh, the barbarians would destroy us. Uh, and Origen says, if all Romans became Christians, if everybody in the empire became Christians, then God will be with us uh, and God would protect us. Uh, I think um, that's what we need to say. It doesn't mean that we wouldn't suffer, uh, but uh, if it's true. Uh, as the historical evidence shows, that uh, nonviolent intervention has worked twice as often as violent intervention to oppose injustice and work for justice, then I think we even have empirical evidence to think that there is an alternative. So do you, so you, you've written over 30 books and you also have a blog and uh, I want our listeners to be able to follow you on your blog. And of course, I want them to, you know, at least entertain this book and enjoy, enjoy the arguments you make in that. Um, so I'm going to, listeners, you can reach Ron at ronsiderblog.substack.com. And I will, I will put the link to that in the show notes page. Ron, thanks for being on the episode with us and talking about your book. And I hope that this is a, a great introduction for our listeners and for and for the readers of your book. It's just it's kind of a it's pretty thorough and it's not even that long. So I really appreciate the work that you've done and thank you for being on. Thanks, Doug. Good to be with you. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Libertarian Christian Podcast. If you like today's episode, we encourage you to rate us on Apple Podcasts to help expand our audience. If you want to reach out to us, email us at podcast at libertarianchristians.com. You can also reach us at LCI Official on Twitter. And of course, we are on Facebook and have an active group you are welcome to join. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Libertarian Christian Podcast is a project of the Libertarian Christian Institute, a registered 501c3 nonprofit. If you'd like to find out more about LCI, visit us on the web at libertarianchristians.com. 
The voiceovers are by Matt Bellis and Catherine Williams. As of episode 115, our audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com. Hey, podcast listeners. Since you like listening to audio content, we wanted to let you know about a new audiobook titled Called to Freedom, Why You Can Be Christian and Libertarian. It's read by me, Jacqueline Isaacs, one of the contributing authors of the book, and every download helps to support the Libertarian Christian Institute. To learn more and to download the audiobook today, go to calltofreedombook.com.